Welcome to Curious with Josh Peck. Start the show. Welcome back to another beautiful episode of Curious, the podcast featuring young Uncle Josh Peck. What's good, guys? Welcome back. Happy Tuesday. God, can you believe this? You and us and me and we here together. I mean, this is just a fucking treat. Man, just got back from a trip. Just got back. I talked about it last week. A lot of anticipation and now I'm back. And there it is in the in the memory books. You know what I mean? That is now a page that will be in my memories and I will be able to look back at it fondly. It was a great trip. A great trip. I was in Boston earlier. Uh, what was I doing there? You know, I went to go meet with the Bank of America team because I'm doing a cool social media activation with them. Great people. Great people. Had a good time. Got to kind of, you know, put on my my business skills, my presentational skills. But look, the reality is I'm just blessed to be able to do stuff like that because then I don't have to you know, do shitty movies, get to work with a cool brand, make a funny video, everybody's happy, make a little scratch, pay your bills, this way I don't have to be, you know, in, you know, middle of Canada for two months making some, I don't know, some horror movie that that we all know isn't going to be great, it's going to eventually be one of those video on demand titles at one night you're just going to be painfully bored and there's nothing to watch on the 800 other channels that you already have and and so you say yeah uh, josh peck he's good right is he I'm not sure i'll give it a try and you turn it on within like conservatively you know 98 seconds you're like this is going to be a clunker <laughs> this is going to be shit it's the cinematography is off the color, it just looks not expensive. The acting's just a little, a little off. And you're starting to silently resent me, maybe subconsciously, because, you know, you, you know, you know we, we've got a trust here. You know what I mean? And now you're sort of like, ah, Josh Peck made me spend four ninety five for this dreck. Thanks a lot, Josh. So I don't do that, you know, I work with cool brands and I get to, you know, make social media videos and hopefully wait for something cool if it ever comes. And if it doesn't, well, well, this is pretty cool, you know, get to be on my podcast with my people. So lucky me. (laughs) Um, Then I went to New York, New York, great, good times with my family, my wife's family. Very cool. Got to be the tour guide, took them around all my spots, artichoke pizza, 14th and 1st great you know what i mean they have this slice that has spinach artichoke dip on the slice i mean the place is named artichoke so you can only imagine and and then they got they got all the other ones they got a um a vodka sauce sicilian slice just let that sit in let let that set in that 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 imagery of a of that delicious sauce that you know you wouldn't naturally think that it it would make its way onto a slice of pizza, but I'm here to tell you that it does, and it's glorious. Good, good spot. Artichoke Pizza, check that out. They're not a sponsor of the show. I'm just I'm just a fan. What else? What else did we do? I uh, I got to shoot with Casey Neistat, the uh, YouTube sensation, mogul, entrepreneur, all around great guy. Yeah, I assume you probably heard of him, and if you haven't, go check out his YouTube channel because the guy just does it right. But more so, I look up to him as just like a man because he's like 37, he's got the wife, he's got the kids, he's got it handled. I think he sold his first company to CNN for like dumb millions, like many millions, seven, eight figures. Eight figures we're talking. That's impressive. I mean, the money, yeah, whatever. It's, you know, money is nice. But, like, more so just the the sheer completion of a project, you know? Because I don't know if you're like me, but I have issues where I'm a big dreamer and I love to fantasize. But when it comes down to putting pen to paper, fucking, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> it's not easy. I think that's what separates the people that do it from the people that dream it. Fucking write that down, write that quote down, put it on a t-shirt, you know? I mean, it's kind of true. You just got to do it. Anyway, K 
Casey does it. And he's got this dope setup on downtown and I don't know where it is, Tribeca. It's below Canal Street, but he's got like this cool new company that he's starting. And I, yeah, I'm just very impressed. I like being around people like that. Pushes me. I'm not sure whether it's sheer jealousy that then makes, you know, motivates me to do more or that I'm inspired, but inevitably, who cares? Maybe it's both, but makes me want to do more, be a better me. And that's what this podcast is for, for you guys, to be a better you. Wow. I got affirmations all over the fucking place. Um, It was just a good time. You know, New York was a nice time. We went to a lovely wedding for family, friends, beautiful, out on Long Island. The people there are a can of corn, salt of the earth, good people. You know what I mean? Just nice. Yeah, nice people. Lovely You know, all different, you know, working class, upper middle class, whatever. Just, you know what? Greenport, Long Island, shout out. It was was quite beautiful. And it's always nice to talk to these guys with these great accents. And they'd be like, oh, fucking Josh Peck, what are you you doing on the island, huh? What are you doing over here? What are you doing in Greenport? What do you, you like? You like it over here? You got family? Oh, you're here for a wedding? Oh, good. God bless. God bless them. God bless you. Big fan. Very nice. You know, I had a weird interaction at the wedding with someone who was lovely, but, well, how do I say this? You know, it was funny. (laughs) So, you know, this woman comes up to me and she was, she was very nice. Well, she comes up and she says, and I've talked about this on the podcast before, and it's just like a slight pet peeve of mine. So forgive me. And if I sound like a jerk in this scenario, I'm sure you'll let me know on Twitter. At it's Josh Peck, um, but she comes up. She goes, "Listen, I I have no idea who you are, and I'm not interested. I don't. You know what? I I have no idea who you are. To me, you are just another human being. But my daughter would like a picture of you for for the reasons I have no I have no understanding why. But you know what? Take the picture because I have no idea who you are. Did I mention I don't know you? And so." Finally, I take the picture, whatever. I'm so happy to oblige and make her daughter happy in any way I can. No no big deal on my part. And then, as we're parting, she feels the need to one more time say, allow me to remind you, no idea who you are. <laughs> to which I finally respond, you know, you don't have to tell me that. You could just, you know, let's just make your daughter happy. And she looks at me and a night, a healthy pause, a beat, some might say, where it literally through my head, I'm going, this woman's going to throw a drink on me or punch me. And she looks at me and she goes, ah, I'm just an asshole, aren't I? <laughs> and to, to which I responded, so nice meeting you. <laughs> so I don't know. that It didn't go the way I expected, but it wasn't bad. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm glad uh, the daughter got the picture. It was very nice meeting them. Um, no, I don't know. It's just a stupid pet peeve of mine, and I'm sure most people don't even realize it, and I'm probably the one to blame. Yeah, what else is new? Um, what's going on in the news, right? We should talk about that. There was a big golf open over the weekend. I hear that was good. Someone won who's important. Tiger almost made his way back. Yeah, I saw a tweet that said, uh, Tiger Woods is going to be so horny if he wins this tournament. Um, I thought that was good. Uh, yeah, you know, golf is one of those things. I never played it growing up. I'm quite awful. My father-in-law is great at it. So is my brother-in-law. And they've taken me out once before to, you know, go to the driving range. And I'm sure they, they're they just looking at me with sheer pity and disgust and just a, a side order of embarrassment that their, their son-in-law, brother-in-law is is completely physically incapable of, of of just having any physical prowess, but especially in golf, it's really a dumb sport. No, I look, people get a lot out of it, so I think that's dope. I just I, I feel like if you never did it and you didn't grow up with it, it's it's hard to see the uh, the joy. I mean, I get that it's pretty and people love you know the walking and the golf. I mean, our president he would he'd like to spend every week there if he could at his golf course. And if I look, all due respect, if I had a golf course named after me, I'd probably want to hang out there too a lot. Fuck, if I had a convenience store named after me, I'd want to be there. But 
But yeah, it's just now at 31, it doesn't look like I'm ever going to pick it up. You know, I'd rather be a good tennis player. That's a good, that's a good adult sport that you can like play with other adults and stay in shape. I don't know. Speaking of, you know, presidential golf courses, Trump warns Iran to never, ever threaten U.S. again or suffer consequences. Now, listen, I'm not going to get political on this podcast because the reality is I I just don't. I, I know I'm not the one. You know what I mean? There's so many other people that are more educated and more um, equipped to give a better opinion about things than I. But what I will say is... And listen, oh, I'll give this other caveat of saying that, look, fucking Trump, you know what? He's not my guy, but inevitably, I think we got the president that we deserved. And that's a quote from my friend Lucas. So I don't, you know, I don't subjugate myself. I don't, I don't uh, um, separate myself or I'm not polarized. I don't think I'm so different from anyone else in, in this country that, that, that voted for him or didn't. I think we are all one, inevitably. So... We got the president we deserve. We all rise together or go down together. We're all breathing the same air. You know what I mean? Anyway, I just find this whole thing with with Trump warning Iran to never ever threaten the U.S. again, that so encapsulates the thing that people love about him. Because for so long, <laughs> I think, you know, politics lacked that fucking schoolyard bully cinematic moment. And that people, when he does stuff like that, there are people, not I, but, you know, there are people that are just rising up with pure joy and excellence and saying, you get him, Donald. You tell him who's boss. Enough is enough. You know, that posturing, it's schoolyard bullying in the best version. And and look, inevitably, like, it, it goes so much further than that. And when you're, you know, when you've got nuclear weapons pointed at each other sometimes i would imagine it requires a bit more nuance in your communication to truly get through the things that you need but i mean yeah you know the big man the the highest man in the highest office stood up for us you know he he really he went toe to toe with goliath and he he told him who's boss good on him you know, that's what people love. I don't know if that's making sense, but I yeah, it's that schoolyard bullying type thing. Yup. What? See, this is why I shouldn't talk about politics because that didn't even make sense to me. Anyway, on today's show, Yvette Nicole Brown. I've known this woman for over 15 years and it has been a joy every single year of that experience. She's incredibly talented. I remember when she came on the set of Drake and Josh, and I think we talk about this in our conversation, within like one day of working together, we all looked at each other and said, well, this this person needs to be on as many episodes as possible immediately. Um, her talent is undeniable from community to to The Odd Couple to Drake and Josh to so many other TV shows, movies. She's a super fan. Um, she's she's just an undeniable talent and a wonderful person. I feel lucky to know her. And so I got to sit down with her for a little bit and chat it up. So hope you guys enjoy. Here's Yvette. What's up, y'all? Sorry to interrupt. It's your boy, Uncle Josh. Um, You know, uh, listen, we're going to get through this together, but uh, this show is successful, so we got some ads this week. Anyway, are you suffering from stagnant workflow, lemon flavor depletion, cross-platform synergy, having a career? You might be entitled to advice from Brandon, vitamin water brand ambassador, and professionally busy man. Call 833-477-8339 to see if he can squeeze you in today. Because as Brandon says, there is nothing more professional than Brandon. Brandon is an unpaid spokesperson for vitamin water and should not be trusted with business advice or any advice for that matter. Who are you? We know that somewhere in the world, someone downloaded this podcast, but we don't know anything about you. The people who support this show would love to know just a little bit about who is listening. If you have two minutes, it really does only take two minutes. Help us make the show an even better experience for you by telling us more about yourself. Just go to listenerq, L-I-S-T-E-N-E-R-Q dot com slash curious and take the short survey. You can also give us direct feedback on the show 
which we would love to hear. And as a thank you, you'll be entered into a drawing for a $100 Amazon gift certificate. Yeah. Two minutes. ListenerQ.com slash curious. That's ListenerQ.com slash curious. I think it's oh, that dulcet, it's, the dulcet sounds. Sultry. It is kind of sultry. Yeah, right? I feel like you should be like, what What would that voice be good for? For like a book on tape or yes. something? Or or like just like a soothing. There's this app called Calm. I've heard Have, about it. Josh. Tell me. Calm is the best thing in the world. First of all, I have insomnia, mm. right? And I'm always trying to find a way to not have insomnia. And Calm is like famous people reading you stories as you go to bed. Really? So they'll be like... Hi, I'm Yvette Nicole Brown, and I'm reading Fox with Socks. <laughs> There's a fox. And you just, and they read it really slow and whatever, and before you know it, it's morning. You're done. You're done. You're done. So, and I think anybody can do one. Like, I don't think it's like, I think we could do one. We could do a calm. I'll do it right now. Do it. Do a calm right now. Shoot. Um, <laughs> three blind mice. <laughs> read, I, read by Josh Peck. I... But why did I think Calm was like a meditation app? It's that too. Oh. It's got the books on tape. It's got uh, meditation. It's got music. It's got sounds. It's the best. And it's not free. But with everything I've said about it, it shouldn't be free. Well, but for everything you've said, you should have a promo code. You're darn right. I feel like I just, and, and honestly, I don't have a kickback. I'm not associated with them at all. I just think they're great. Just type in Yvette Nicole Brown <laughs> for 25% off. You know what's so funny, too? I've been told before that I give away way too many things for free. Because I'm such a promo person. Like, I love promoting my friends and stuff. And I do right. stuff like I just did. I did a commercial for an app I have nothing to do with, which is ridiculous. <laughs> it's Yvette's picks. It's my picks. You know, it's funny. My my One of my best friends, Cameron, he has to fall asleep yeah. to a book on tape every night. See? And he listens to the British reading of, like, the Harry Potter series. It's so classy. But whenever, like, he and I have shared a hotel room before, and, like, yeah. just the buzz of his headphone will keep me keep up you in up that. Because I'll swear I can hear coming <laughs> out of, like, his earlobe, like, and then Hermione <laughs> walked into the chamber. You should, you should just put it on speaker and just have the experience. Really? You know? Is he doing it because he wants to go to sleep, or is he doing it because... It's, he just wants to read the book, and he doesn't have time to read the book, and it's the best time to do it. No, he has insomnia, yeah. and it's like the only cure for him. See, he might be listening to Calm, and you don't know it. Yeah, right? Ooh. Have you always had the insomnia? I have not always had the insomnia. Um, it's like as I've gotten older. I almost Is it to, neuroses? Yeah, I think What's it, it might from? be. I think it's kind of like as you get older. Let me tell you, young man, as you get older, mm. I'm a bit older than you. I think when you get older, your body's like, I ain't got much time. Right. And so your body's like, I'm going to grab these five, this hot five. Right. You know what I mean? And yeah. then let that be enough to get you through the day. You know what I mean? I, that's what I think. Because I remember when I was a kid, my mother only slept like five hours a night. And so I think it's kind of when you get older, unless it's just genetics between me and my mom. But right. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Do you think it was your mom slept just for that chunk because there was work to be done? She had kids to take care Probably. of? Probably. And... Don't you think that? I mean, you don't have kids yet. but No. I think... Once you have kids, I don't think you ever sleep fully anyway. You're always kind of one eye open, I would think. I'm sure. Because you're concerned about your kids. So it could have been that. We also lived in East Cleveland in the hood, so it might not have been the safest area. So she might have had an eye, one eye open to make sure nobody was breaking in. Right. There was some tomfoolery yes, going some tom on. There was some tomfoolery going on back then. So, yeah. I, yeah, I wonder that because I feel like it's sleep as you get older becomes this commodity mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that is so coveted and i so precious i hear it in my my mom finally got to a place and she mama. she's the best i love his mom you guys his mom's the best she's she's a dream yeah. and she too was like and she's like very you know not a medicine mm -hmm. person at all but she started taking like melatonin yeah. and like kind of the natural sleep mm -hmm. re remedies because she's like, I'm 74, yeah. I can't sleep, yeah. and who cares, who cares if I pop a Tylenol PM every Live now your and life, again? Girl. Live you know? your life, girl. Live your life. Let me just enjoy this. Yeah. So you talk about your mom and growing up in Akron. Uh, well, Cleveland. Or I, well, Cleveland, I went to, I went sorry. To no, you're good, because I went to college in Akron. That's probably where you got it from. Got you. But I grew, I grew up in East Cleveland, yeah. And what was, Cle I mean, what was the land like The then? land like back then. This was like the 80s? This is the 80s. Okay. Um, it was my brother and me and my mom. It was three, three of us, single parent home. My dad was around. They just were divorced. Sure. Um, I remember it being idyllic, which is crazy. Like, uh, looking back now, I mean, it's much worse now, but back looking back, it was like, oh, it was kind of a rough neighborhood. 
But at the time, it was lovely, you right. know. And we lived there until I think I was in fifth grade when we moved up to like the suburbs. And for me, it was like culture shock because we went from you know, kids in like Wrangler jeans and ponytails and these girls were in like designer jeans and were going to get the hair done and Fancy. they you know, had like coach purses and stuff. And I was like, who are these aliens? <laughs> so that was like culture shock for me. But I remember what I remember most growing up was we didn't have a lot material, but we yeah. had a lot of love. Like I just remember being so much love in my house, like between me and my mother and my brother, we used to call ourselves the three musketeers and we were just really, really close. So it almost made you forget, like, we may not have extravagant Christmases or Christmas at all. You know what I mean? It was more like sure. Christmas, you're getting some underwear and <laughs> okay. some the socks, the, the essentials. essentials. You, want okay. to, you want the lights on? Yeah. Merry Christmas. Exactly. You know, it was that okay. kind of deal. So, which is fine. Like, my mother's like a straight talker, kind of like me. So it was cool. Did you find yourself, because I have, you know, I grew up with a single mom and, and I, I've never, you know, I never got to meet my pops, but I felt slightly <laughs> raised by this tigress mother mm -hmm. who was tough and yeah. fabulous in so many ways but had to sort of serve the roles of both, both parents right. in some respect and then i also found myself raised a little bit by the television 100 percent. did man. you find that as well 100 yeah. percent. because i again i'm older than you but when i grew up and i don't know if this was still happening when you got here but we had latchkey kids where I mean, and they were still abducting kids and killing kids back in the 70s and 80s. But for some reason, they put a key around your neck and be like, goodbye. Right. And you would walk yourself to school, walk yourself home. And I just remember, you know, just feeling very adult when I was a kid. And, yes. and I was deciding some things. My mother didn't come home till like 5 o'clock. So I would come home and turn on TV. And it was like just watching sitcoms and cartoons. And that was kind of what formed who I am, you know, right. don't you feel like it formed your comedy and stuff too? Like, oh, the without stuff, a doubt, hundred percent, right? I th I find especially, I mean, and and you think about stuff like Drake and Josh mm -hmm. and how I was just trying to do an impression of Jackie Gleason. I was doing an impression of Marla Gibbs, really from um the Jeffersons. Unreal. Yes, like you do you you do what you know. Did, you know what I mean? Did you know that initially, or was it revealed halfway through? You're like, oh, I I kind of am stealing I, a little bit of this I think or that. I kind of realized it later in my career that I'm pretty much doing any role I do is mm. either Marla it's a, a, some type of mixture of Marla Gibbs, Felicia Rashad, or right. B. Arthur. Those oh. three people have informed... The Mount Rushmore come on, man. of matriarchs. Right. Right. Like, right. They have just informed everything I've ever done because all three of those women were always the smartest person in the room. In any scene you walk in, they were the smartest person in the room. Yes. They all had a tough edge at times, but they still were lovable. Right. And they all had a way with a joke, especially Marla Gibbs. Like, there's nobody can... Her comedic timing is is second to none. Yes. So um, I do think it just I think I didn't make a choice, but I think out of osmosis because that's what you grew up watching, you just look up and go, oh, holy crap! You know what I mean? This is pretty cool that I'm I'm embodying some of the things that she did. And it's funny you say Jackie Gleason for you. Now that you say it, I can see it. Sure. But I don't think when we were younger doing Drake and Josh, I was like that kid's doing Jackie. I don't think it ever hit me then. But yes. now that you say it, I'm like. Okay, I get it now. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that there is this intrinsic, you know, I always feel like comedy is musical. I it's yeah. rhythmic. It's rhythmic. You can yes. hear the ba da ba ba ba. You can hear it. Mm -hmm. 100%. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And who's the famous, uh, he's the famous multi cam director? James Burroughs? Yes. Who turns his back? Yes. And he yeah. could just listen. He listens and knows. And wouldn't even have to watch a take and would know if it was right because. And especially, and I find comedy has sort of shifted now, mm. where it's sort of uh, the taste has become more of like, I don't, I don't know if reality mm -hmm. based or whatever, but of the old sticky sitcom yeah. rhythm, there's a certain banter, and, there is. and you ha you gotta hit those moments. And you either hear the music or you don't. Like I think when things shifted to single cam, there's a, a whole generation of people that have come up that don't hear the music. Yes. So when you when you now that multicam is kind of coming back a little bit. There's people that don't really know that, but da 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 da. It's just there really is, and when you read it, you can hear it. Like I can, I write notations in my script almost like musical notes. I'll know where the pause is and where this should breathe, this should go up. You can just literally ride the wave of it if yes. it's written well. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And do you feel like growing up and watching these shows that there was a, you know, I I find too that I. 
I, I love the new comedy, mm-hmm. but I have an affinity for the old. Oh, come on. I right? live I live for multi. Um, I think because it's in my DNA. You know what I mean? Especially, like, your generation grew up on Nickelodeon, which was the only place for a while you could get a multi-cam sitcom. Yes. Because around the time you were coming up, they were starting to just kind of segue into the single cam thing. So I think your generation, for sure, is very is almost neck and neck with mine. There's a group now, though, that I think that started watching TV around the time Community and Parks and Rec and, and 30 Rock started, they they missed it. Unless they're catching reruns on Nickelodeon, their touchstone is the single cam way of doing it. Right. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out later on, you know? Yeah. I feel like multi-cam and, and Nickelodeon type shows in 70s and 80s sitcoms, there is such a unique thing, you know? Right. And I did a pilot this past pilot season, and... There were a couple of people on the show that had never done a multicam before, and it was like, oh, what is this? What is this? Like, what do you mean? There's no fourth wall. Like, they just could not, they, in their whole career, they'd never had to do it. Right. So one of them was saved because he was a, a stage actor. So he was like, oh, wait, okay. So it's a stage. It's, it's a play. Once you realize that, you're good. But otherwise, you're walking on this set like, well, what? Why, what is it? Why are people in the stands? What is, you know, it's, it's so foreign. It's a different energy for sure. <clears throat> and... I think what's interesting too, it's funny, when we had we had finished Drake and Josh mm-hmm. in two thousand six and then we took like a two year break and came back for the Christmas movie. Yes. And in that time I had done, you know, some movies and the whackness mm-hmm. and certain things that required it to be smaller. You know, more grounded. Mm-hmm. And I remember we came back and doing my first scene of the Christmas movie with um uh, with Kimbo Slice, oh, R.I.P. May he rest in peace, my God. Like, just a gem of a mm, guy. Sweet man. And I remember we did the first few takes, and Dan, the creator mm-hmm. of the show, took me over to the side, and he's like, you know, and and God bless him, because he was a huge fan of what I had done right. since Drake and Josh. Right, but... But he said, that's not going to fly here. Mm-hmm. And he just said, what you're doing is great if this was like an indie movie, right. but you've got to ramp the energy back up to right. where we were. And I right. was like, and of course, because I had done it for so long, I was like, okay, gotcha. Right. And it sort of clicked right back. But I remember thinking like, yeah, like this is And isn't... did it feel too big to you for a minute? Like for a minute where you like, of this course. is huge. Yeah. Right, right. Oh, I mean, I'm a shtick machine. Tell me about at, it. At Don't heart. I know. Don't I know. Jesus. And Come like, on, I Pam. Mean, and, and sometimes <laughs> to my detriment where I'm like, all right, really, you know, I'm milking this yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's my natural sort of resting default. Right. And yet, yeah, I remember sort of having to go back to that place. But I mean, there's nothing like the roar of an audience when That's you true. know something works. Yeah. And you know, like, oh, I hit it. Like, right. th- that's why comedy is the closest yeah. thing to justice. Yeah. Because you know, immediately, it's not, there's no objectivity to right. it. It's just, or it, it, there is objectivity. It's not subjective. Right. Like, it's clear, like, that connected. And could you feel it, though? Because I don't, I came in on Drake and Josh, I think, hold on, I have to cough. No, no worries. I came in on Drake and Josh, I think, maybe either the tail end of the first season or the second season. I can't mm. remember. I don't remember us ever having an audience. Like we would get the the the, right. the crew would laugh for us, but I don't remember ever being audience. Can you hear the music? Can you hear where the laughs are without an audience? I, or do you need that? Do you prefer? It's funny. I I love the audience, mm-hmm. and I find that you just you know in your bones if something yeah, has something hit. Funny. Yeah. And then it's funny. You know, I got to work with Zelda Williams, who's mm-hmm. Robin's daughter, and oh. on a movie, and and she could just tell like what an insane deep fan I was of his and and am and. And she said, you know, there's this great story that that I always tell people about when my dad first did Good Morning Vietnam. Okay. And she said, like, remember, he was coming off Mork and Mindy, which mm-hmm. was traditional sitcom, laugh. Huge, right. You know, immediate response. Right. She said, and if you watch really closely, even in the final product, there are slight millisecond moments where after a joke, he looks in the camera because he was almost trying to see how the joke landed. Wow. And see the reaction. Yeah. And it was like, and you know, and it's only like if you're really paying, paying attention, attention and it's a millisecond of a moment. Yeah. But he was, you know, that's how he was sort of groomed. Yeah. And for me, it's like I so understand that yeah. that that love of the the immediate reaction. And you know what's funny? I'm I'm weird in this way. Like mm. I love the multicam format, but I really prefer it in a hybrid form. Like I liked it the way we did it on Drake and Josh. Yes. Because I'm a people pleaser, right? Yes. So if you add an audience, 
it's not me performing to get the rush from them. It's me performing so that they're happy too. Right. So you're already, you're making, you have to make your cast members happy. You have to make the director happy. You have to make sure you're doing something that the camera likes. And then you add a whole nother level of Ugh. pressure with the people. It's so exhausting. It's exhausting. So for me, because I can feel the music, mm. I know when I got it and when I don't have it. And I remember uh, I had a coming back moment kind of like you. We had done, we finished Drake and Josh and even had finished the movie and I started doing Community, which is, I mean, it's kind of a cartoonish show when you think about it, but single, single cam. cam. Right. And so we came back. Uh, Dan asked me to come back and do Victorious. And I hadn't done Helen in two or three years. I, you know, had said goodbye to that character and was now embodying another completely wacky character. And my biggest fear was, oh, my God, when I watch this episode, is Helen going to be Shirley? Right. Like, do I, do I, am I a good enough actress where I can create two completely different weirdos and will it land so I almost waited a long time to actually watch the episode because I was so terrified when I first watched it and realized that one I was able to grab Helen and bring her back because it had been years but then she really is a completely different person from who Shirley is right. <clears throat> so it's like I was happy to see that that our characters live in us and it might be just a little tap on the shoulder going take it up just a little bit like you're not giving enough or mm. you know it just it's it's good to know that they don't ever really leave us. You know what I mean? We can go into the voice or the mannerisms if we have to. Yes. You know, so. And do you think, <clears throat> I, I think people would be interested to hear because the dynamic of a live, you know, taping for a sitcom yeah. is so, I mean, because, and I'll qualify this because I have to because it's the day and age we live in yeah. of like, it's so wonderful. We're so lucky. So yes, blessed. Blessed. So happy. Thank God. But when you're there and it's Friday and it's mm -hmm. four o'clock yes. and they've brought in, you know, 200 people and yeah. they're like getting hopped up on candy and pizza, <laughs> and, pizza. and you've got like this <laughs> wonderful stand up comic who's there trying to keep the audience alive. But four hours in, they want to go home. home. And you know what? So, so do, do we. we. <laughs> and everyone. <laughs> and sometimes you have those magical nights where everything's hitting and you know, you get everything in two takes, but sometimes it takes 10. It's being a dead horse, yeah. Uh -huh. And the audience has heard that joke, yep. and it ain't funny it anymore. It ain't funny. And you're like, oh, my God, yeah. this is slightly torturous. Yeah, but can you say this, though? Even that, what you described, isn't it still a lighter experience than your worst day on a single camera set? 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. The worst day on a single camera show, and again, grateful, lovely, awesome. The worst day on a single camera show is what I think hell is. Like if I had to oh, pick yes. what hell is, it would be the worst, longest, most tedious day on a single camera show. Because they're already hard work. And you add in, if you can't get the lighting right or the camera can't is in the wrong place or somebody's forgetting their lines or you know somebody has Montezuma's Revenge, whatever the <laughs> sure. thing is, the, the, the mix Life of things. Life happens. Life happens. It just feels so long. It feels like the longest day on the planet. Well, and I think so too, and this is one reason why I do appreciate the sitcom structure, and it's and I don't favorite it because I think single cam has a whole other yeah. uh, benefit. But you know, the way that a single cam is set up is the first three days you are doing run throughs and rehearsing, mm -hmm. and you're not filming. Nope. So every day you have a chance to show what you've got to the writers and the right. director, and then they conspire and say, how can we elevate the jokes? Make it better. Kill right. the ones that didn't work, right. and, and make the ones that did work even better. Right. So you know, for better or for worse, by Friday when you're filming, you're good. You're probably there. Mm -hmm. Whereas you could show up Monday morning to something that's maybe never been read out loud yep. on a single cam, and you just go, I believe that this was funny in the writer's room. Right. But for some reason, it coming out of my mouth is not, is not exactly. working. And guess what? We're going to film it anyway. Right. We're going to film it. Yeah, it's so, happening. So, you know, and if and worst case scenario, at lunch, they will reassess some scenes for later in the day. And you'll come back and you'll have new sides. But we're going to keep filming all day no matter what's in your hand. Yeah. Time is money. Time is money. Let's go. Time is money. The other thing. If I had to pick one other thing that's an advantage of a of a multi cam over single, I'm not a makeup hair girl. Like Me I'll do it. Uh, yeah, I'll same do, here. I can't. I'll do it if I gotta do it. But I'm not someone's like. Let me get up, put my lashes on. When you're working a single cam, you are in makeup and hair every single day. And if you're a girly girl or a, or a macho, I don't know what a metrosexual guy, it's mm. cool for you. Otherwise, no. I like rolling in in my cute little sweats, my Bless. baseball cap. 
and and rehearse for three days and then get cute on the two tape days. You know? Same here. It's the other thing. Yeah. I you know it's it's funny. It's a reason why I don't film this uh. because I found that. You know, there are certain people that yeah. feel like, well, that that adds a whole other layer right. to it. I've right. got to get done up. <laughs> right. And I also felt like maybe a video aspect would affect the intimacy of, uh, of what this. it is. And you know what's funny? I started to call you to see if, you know, you were going to take pictures or video. And I was like, eh, I had a meeting today anyway, so I had to get it somewhat together. <laughs> yeah, I know that. But I was like, let me, this is like our, our reunion. We haven't seen each other since I visited you on set. Of I remember. Grandfather. So my thought was... I'm going to take a picture with Josh anyway, so I want to look nice whether he films it or not. So. And you do. Thank you, Josh. You are crushing Thank it. Thank you, Hard Josh. body karate. <laughs> <laughs> a Thank sight, you. a vision. Back at you, baby. <laughs> Back at you. Um, <laughs> and do you think that, do you think that, it, going back to what you were talking about, about your family structure growing yeah. up, I don't know if, and, and maybe I'm projecting, but growing up, I think I had an affinity for sitcoms because of the traditional family unit yes. that I was watching. Yeah. Did you feel that? I feel the same way. And also what I loved about it was it was, it, there's a family aspect of it and then there's the familiarity of it. Mm. Every time you turn on Sanford and Son, you're going to see the junkyard, the living room, and the kitchen. Right. That's familiar. It is no, As much as life changes, that stays the same. They're going to come down the same staircase, sit on the same couch. That part of it was also very comforting to yes. me as a kid, especially, you know, like I said, being latchkey, you come home and, and you're by yourself. Me and my brother were there by ourselves. Mm. And it just felt like somebody was home with us. You know, the Jeffersons right. were home with us or whatever. We watched a lot of uh, 60s sitcoms in the 80s. They put like uh, Brady Bunch and I Dream of Jeannie. Those types of things were in heavy reruns. They rerun those shows so much. I didn't know they weren't new. Kind of <laughs> right. probably how kids feel about Drake and Josh now. Right. You know, they. I bet they. I bet this happens to you. You go out and you see a kid and they're like, wait a minute. Like, it looks like him, but he's a yeah. man. Right? Oh, I can't believe the disparity between a 29-year-old who will come up yeah. to me and be like, you were my childhood. Right. And I'll be like, I'm two years I'm older two years than old. you. Relax, dude. Right. But, but then a 10-year-old. It's like, you're my childhood. And I'm like, I can't. I, it. I ran into Miranda recently. I ran, was at randomly at the Anthropology. My favorite store is another free commercial. It's a great store. It's a great store. Yes. And um, ran into her and her mom. And it always blows my mind when I see her because she's frozen at like 12 in my brain. Sure. And then maybe two weeks later, maybe a month later, she's celebrating her 25th freaking birthday. Well, how... <laughs> It's weird. How is Miranda Cosgrove 25? I know. It's so weird. It's so weird. She was my little sister. She's a baby. I know. She dates. She, she does, dates? She does all the things. This is unacceptable. That young women no, do. No, you don't do those things. She's No, she doesn't. It's breaking. It no, breaks she doesn't. You do my not. Heart. Fuzzy, if you're listening, <laughs> cut it out. Enough already with Enough this whole Enough with the whole meeting growing people. up and meeting and dating. Save it. Will you just freeze, <laughs> freeze your adolescence? Freeze your adolescence. <laughs> um... <laughs> And how was your relationship with your brother growing up? Were you guys super close? We were very close growing mm. up. And we, we are still very close. We are just we just don't talk as much as we used to. Sure. But my, me and my brother's relationship is such that if I call him, we're going to be on the phone for four hours. Yeah. Like just from start to finish, we're going to run everything down. And we also have this thing where if one of us has a mayday, like if mm. one of us is going through a heartbreak or a job situation or something that we're just not feeling, we get it. We know that the other person, if there's one other person in the world that will understand exactly where I'm coming from, my brother will. Right. You know what I mean? So we can get on the phone. He'll be like, well, you know, like mom always says, Vin. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just, it's a, it's a touchstone that's really great. Yeah. You got, yeah. there's nothing like sharing a parent, you know, right. sharing parents. Right. Only, you know, it's, uh, it's funny. It's come up in acting class too, yeah. where I've ever, whenever I've had a scene with a sibling or yeah. something. And our teacher, Sharon, she'll always say, like, remember, like, this person saw you through everything. Everything. And sometimes she'll even say, she'll stop a scene in the middle, and she'll be like, hold hands. Yeah. She's like, just be there, like, be in each other's space for a minute, yeah. because, like, it's thicker than you could ever imagine. Yeah. Your, your past and your relationship. Yeah, I saw, it's funny you say this, I saw a video, a, a picture today on Instagram. It was, it was a, a I guess, a late Father's Day post. And mm. it was a guy, I don't know these people, it was on the Explore page. Uh, a, a father... On one side, it's a father holding both of his kids in his arms when they were like, I don't know, five and four. Yes. And then it was another picture of him holding them when they're like 25 and 24. <laughs> and he's dying because the son is really huge now and the daughter's, you know. 
And I noticed that the daughter and the, the brother, everybody was just entwined. Right. And for a minute, I was like, that's a lot of closeness. And I'm like, that's her brother and her dad. That's her, her his sister and his dad. Like, that's what family is. Family is limbs right. intertwined and face smushed to the side of somebody else's face. Like, I have a picture of me and my brother sleeping in my mom's bed where he literally, his foot is literally on the side of my face. And right. I'm just, that's just what it is. Like, yeah. it's just that level of closeness and understanding, you know? Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm just, you know, my mom and I are incredibly close. And it's so cool being married now and my wife being from, like, a big, big traditional, family. you know, beautiful family. And, and even, it, it's funny, recently we were all at a wedding together. Yeah. And they were like, oh, let's get a family photo. And so... The siblings and the parents get together, and I'm like, "Oh, here, I'll take it." And they're like, "No, no, no you're a part of the family. You're a part of the family." How is that for you? Oh, it's mind blowing. Because it's just been you and your mom my whole life. That has got to be like the most amazing thing ever. It's awesome. And is it good for her too? Like, is she able to release you and let you be a part of another? It's fabulous. Good. And and not that I don't think my wife would have been absolutely wonderful had I had a big family of my right. own, but I think it's great that she doesn't have to share me yes. <laughs> because, you know, they include my mom and they're so wonderful oh, with that. so great. But they're, it's their big family and then my mom and I. And That's so, so perfect, though. I feel like it's weirdly the universe rewarding me because had, you know, my wife not had that family, it wouldn't have mattered. Right. But it's such a bonus. Right, and you also would have never known. Like right. you didn't, you don't, you know now what you would have been missing, but at the time you wouldn't have known. Like if you, if she didn't have a big family, you wouldn't have known how right. great it is. You know, oh. I wonder what that's like too, because like I said, it was just me, my mother, and my brother. So that's a very small unit as well. Yes. So I mean, if I'm ever married, if I ever marry, <laughs> it might be nice if my my husband has a big family to just see what that is like. But then on the other side, I'm kind of a loner. So am I, and Ooh. that will come up. Ooh. And like sometimes when we're on long family vacations and everyone, I mean, when you're part of a big family, you get good at chilling. Right. Because it's a, you know, we all are under one roof right. and we will entertain each other. Right. And like, thank God I now have found my balance where it's like, I love you all so much. I'm going to go to the gym. Right. Barnes and Noble and perhaps a coffee bean. Right. Line. By see myself. You, see you later. <laughs> see you all in four and a half in four hours. four and a half hours. Yeah. And. And there, it's not good or bad. It's just what I need to sort of keep right. my sanity. And my wife, on the other hand, is totally fine, chilling all day. Because her whole life, she's she's used to right. it. Right? How many how many siblings? Uh, she's one of four. Oh wow! Yeah, that's a big family. But it's so fabulous for me too, like observing all like just the isms yeah. of what you know, or especially something I've had to learn is as an only child, I'm so. I mean, who knows uh, all my deep seated. Uh, insecurity yeah. but I'm so damn sensitive yeah and also my mom always brought me around all her girlfriends right and so I'm like I'm a grown-up <laughs> right. at 10 I was right. a grown-up right and so it's so interesting seeing how siblings are someone breaking your balls all every day the time. and it teaches you how to be tough that's so and I didn't have that but do you know how mature it is and how evolved it is to be able to say as a man that I'm sensitive like really? most, oh my God, most men would never admit that they're sensitive. I feel like it's in fashion. It might be. I hope it gets in more fashion. I yeah. think that guys somehow feel like they're not supposed to feel and they're not supposed to admit that things hurt their feelings. And I mm. think a lot of relationships would be saved if men would admit that they're they're hurt instead of mad. Yes. You know what I mean? I think a lot of times the natural set point is when I'm walking out the door. They right. say, but why though? Because I said something you ain't like. Right. But let's talk about it. You know what I mean? Like I yes. think so. I think that's really good that you're honest about that because then she can be a little more tender with you. She can be careful. Oh, God knows she's had to be too. I she's, love it. it. Sometimes the roles are reversed in the sense of like she's like, God, do we really have to talk about everything? All your feelings. Enough already. <laughs> and it's fascinating because, and I've talked about this on the pod before. I had to learn that, you know, you. When you have siblings and you yeah. have family, family doesn't leave. Right. So you're allowed to mess up. Right, because no one's going anywhere. Yeah, you're allowed to be mad at each other. Right. You're allowed to even go to sleep angry. Yep. Because no one's going anywhere. We're it's family. It's blood. It's blood. And me, I've got that fight or flight like, well, if this is if this is going this way, I suppose we should call it. I'm the same <laughs> way, Josh. 
What does this come from? It's from our childhood. Is it? It's Freudian. Oh, yeah. Holy crap, man. It's I'm deep. literally like, well, it was nice knowing you. Yeah, thanks. And it's like I just said, I want to have pizza over hamburgers, babe. I'm like, I don't care. You don't love me. Right. Thanks for and the he's memories. he's like, what? I know. I know. Like, everything is like the freaking end. It's crazy. It's just, uh, it's all... You know, and, and it's funny, too. I, I was talking to my buddy, Jordan Rock, Chris yes. Rock's younger brother, yes. and he's the best. And, and he grew up with a single mom, too. And we were just sort of trading stories yeah. once. And he was like, you have to understand, he said, a single mom. And it, it's hard enough growing up as our mothers did in the times that they did right. being female. Right. You know, and, and sort of the injustice. and Right. And things that they had to fight against. And then being like the sole parent. The sole breadwinner too. Yeah. I mean, they are, I know I said tigress before, but they develop such ferocity. Yeah. And sometimes now, like if my mom and I butt heads a little bit, I'll be like, Ma, it's all like, we're past that. Right. Like, it's all good. Like, right. you, you don't have to flex on me. Right. <laughs> like, I, I get it. You're in charge. You're the one. Yeah. Like, you're alpha. I'm your fan. <laughs> right. You win. <laughs> like, I love it. Right? It's so true. It's so true. What What did your mom do? She was a secretary. She really? worked at um, General Electric in Ohio for 35 years. A company woman. Yeah, she was a company woman. Wow. I was blown away when she told me recently that by the time she retired, after 35 years, she was only making $25,000. Unreal. How did she raise two kids off of, well, less than 25000 for most of that time? I'm, I'm blown away by that. You know what I mean? So that, yeah, that's some superhero that's some, shit. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. And she's still in Ohio? She's here. She she really? lives 10 minutes from me. She moved. I came out here in 94 or 95, and she came the next year, so 96, 97. So she's been here a while. She took a little detour to Vegas to play bingo for, Good like for 10 her. or 11 years. and then she We all need out. hobbies. Listen, why not? Gamble, gamble. Does, do she, does she still gamble? She still gambles. God bless her. She's not. She's actually at bingo right now. Small She's pots, a, I assume. Well, I mean, we <laughs> define small pot. Like for me, I I think some of these games, it's like 20 bucks to buy in. That's not a cheap game to me. Well, you know, uh, if you, you play for the day? No, I don't think it's for the day. Oh. I think it's like for, like I think maybe she could go to bingo in town for like $100 a night. But my thing is, All if right. I'm giving you $100, I need, you, I need to come back with two. <laughs> right. I can't, you can't just drop $100 a night. Like, who could do that? This is entertainment. Man. I don't know. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like entertainment unless you're winning. <laughs> That's the fun part. Yeah. I Well, yeah. Well, Vegas isn't built on winners. No, it is not <laughs> built on winners. <laughs> um, but it's great to have her close. It is. And yeah. I, I take care of my dad. I've talked about this a, a thousand times, but my dad has dementia. Mm. And um, I went and got him uh, 2013. So it's been uh, five years. In December, it'll be five years. He lives with me. I'm his sole caregiver. Wow. Which is really cool. And so, uh, not cool that he has dementia. That, that sounded weird. But cool that I'm able to be there with him as he mm. walks this journey. So when I have to work out of town, my mother will come and stay. She lives like 10 minutes away, so she'll come and stay with us. And the funny thing about it, this is the first time in my life I've lived in the same house with my dad. Right. Ever. Like, they got divorced when I was like one years old. So I've never, when I moved him in, it was the first time I'd ever been in the same house with him. And what's that Isn't dynamic it? like? My dad is the coolest dude. Like, he's really laid back. He's very funny. The dementia affects his memory, and some days are better than others. Like some days he's there but not really there, and then other days it's like the, the cloud or the, the, the blinds are lifted and he's 100% there. such a weird disease. But what I do is I just pop in on him in the morning. By the time I say, hey, Daddy, how he responds to me, I'll know what kind of day it's going to be, and I just I roll with whatever day it is because he has no control over it. Right. You know, so it's been a really interesting Interesting thing to be the the keeper of someone else's memories, which is the way I see it. Like mm. he's got really strong memories from certain, like anywhere from like 15 and younger, he has great memories. Mm. It's almost like a blur from like 15 to now. So different things will pop in, but he remembers his childhood more than anything. So sometimes I'm like, yeah, dad, remember that time we went there? He'd be like, no, I bet I don't remember that. I go, well, dad, this is what happened. We went here and, you know, so that's, it's kind of a, a gift because every story is new to him. Right. You got to find, uh, I think in life, you know how they say limits, turn limits into lemonade. You have every, everything that happens to you, there's something in it that is good. Like right now, I don't have my voice. And I could be like, oh, it sucks. I do a podcast on my voice. But we are immortalizing this amazing huskiness. I'm telling you. That we you. never would have had before. Like this is the only time in life that you'll get to hear 
me speak like this, and it's great that this gets to be immortalized. I like it a little bit. This is going in the in the files. I think it the, should in the vault. I think it should the annals, the, perhaps. And the annals, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it, it, in a weird way, it is sort of like the the circle of life yeah. in taking care of our parent, right? A hundred percent. But you know what's so deep about it, Josh? Like I'm. I'm older than you, and I'm I'm a little morbid by nature. I realize this about myself. Mm. Like I just been realizing, like my new way of getting over anything quicker is like we all gonna die anyway. Yeah. Like when you really just break down whatever big dream you have, whatever heartbreak you have, like it doesn't mean that you don't feel it and don't accept it, and it is horrible or whatever. But it's not really gonna matter because we all gonna die. Right. Whoever breaks your heart, they gonna die too. <laughs> like yes. everybody's gonna die. The person didn't give you the job. They gonna die one day. Yeah. Person cut you off on the four hundred five. They gonna die too. So it's kind of a great equalizer and makes you kind of go, well, I don't know when I'm gonna go. So let me stay in the moment. Let yes. me just experience the good, the bad, the whatever it is. Let me just fully experience it because today may be my day and I don't even know it yet. That's what's so deep about it. When we go, most of us don't know what's happening or it's, it's gonna happen. Yes. So why not just accept that? Let stuff roll off your back. And just try to enjoy every single second that you're still here. And that's kind of the place that I'm at now. It's just. There's a great Seinfeld bit where he goes, in 60 years, right. all new people. Exactly. <laughs> it's so true. All new people. It's true. I was thinking this, too, about, you know, those of us in the industry mm. who are just chasing these dreams. And everything feels so. Important, right? Impo- the stakes. You, oh. you want to know how not important it is? Tell Walk me. down the Hollywood Boulevard. Right. And look at those stars. For every Michael Jackson that will transcend generations, there's like a Mary Jenkins yes. that was important enough in 1939 or whenever she got her star to be selected to get that great honor, which was probably an even bigger honor back then, right? Sure. And now we're walking over going, who the hell is Mary Jenkins? Right. Exactly. So Was, was she so, on CSI she, she, Miami? Hi. <laughs> right. So whatever great thing she did that she fought and scratched and climbed and prayed for and fought for that she did, we're 40, 50, 60, 90 years from it, and nobody gives a shit. Can I cuss? Please. Nobody gives a shit. Sorry. Yes. I just cussed and I'm husky. <laughs> um, nobody cares. And so it's not in any way to diminish the work of the people from the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. But it kind of gives you perspective to those of us in 2018 that are chasing it. Like, okay, you got an Emmy. That's nice. Right. 50 years from now, no one will care. No one gives a shit. No one gives a shit. So maybe don't step on people's necks to get the Emmy. Oh, Maybe you don't become a jerk to get something that 30 years from now, no one will care about. Oh, come on. It's a great equalizer. It equalizes everything. And I feel like anyone, you know, with any sort of... There are no new ancient truths. Right. And so anyone with any semblance of spirituality, be it super religious mm-hmm. or what have you, there's, I think this is a Rumi quote, but it- I it, love Rumi. Uh, but it's yeah. something to the effect of like, we get to a place where we we neither rejo- rejoice nor despair. Hi. Right? Isn't that the goal? It's just some- it's just, just to be, float. listen. It's be in the middle. Can I just be like- I? Not and this is listen for those listening. We are not saying give up and don't have dreams. And, no, not at no, all. No, it's great because life is boring. Life otherwise, life is boring. Otherwise, but how about you don't let whether you get the dream or not destroy your day? Yes, that's all I'm saying. Like chase everything, chase what you want, but understand that you can't take none of it with you. We all gonna die anyway, and nothing worth having is worth stepping on a neck to get. I don't care what it is. Yeah, it's just not worth it. So how about you just practice kindness and to others and chase your dreams and just try to. Stay equal. Right. Just don't go crazy one way or the other. A buddy of mine always says, you know, the thing that great times and hard times have in common is that they're impermanent. Hi. And that the universe demands balance. Come on. So know that, you know, we're all in such fear and and projection of the tough times. Right. But just know this. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. Oh so my God, it's we so must gosh. find meaning in it. It's so true. Find your meaning. And I think sometimes... The great times are there just so you can have something. Is there there like a port in the storm for when it gets dark? You know, because I always think of life in 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 seasons, Mm. right? When you're in the summertime, it's amazing. It's amazing, but then it gets a little too hot, 
Then yes. it's too sticky and you can't wait for it gets a little cooler. Then it gets into fall and the leaves are changing like this is beautiful. Then it's too many leaves. And <laughs> right. it's you know, and the t- trees are bare and you want something else. Then it starts to snow. Oh, it's so wonderful. Then it's too cold. <laughs> right. Which, you know what I mean? And then you want the, the, the flowers to bud and grow. You, we all, There's a longing. There's a, a point in every season where you're longing for the next season. It's the same thing. When stuff is too good for too long, you immediately start to go, mm. Right. And then the shoe drops, and you're like, eh, and then you're like, uh, and then the good comes. It's just a cycle. You just got to keep going, keep going. That should be the name of your self-help book if you ever put it's it It's a out. cycle. It's a cycle or Too Many Leaves. Too Many, it's too <laughs> many Leaves. Too Many Leaves by Ben Nicole Brown. You know, it's funny, like, just from the, the, uh, the career standpoint, during pilot season, I was auditioning for some fabulous one-hour procedural, yes. procedural, which I'm sure is great. <laughs> Did he get the <laughs> uh, Who knows? Who knows? And I'm sitting in the waiting room, and I was looking, and here I'm sitting there, and I've I've been lucky enough to work a good amount yeah. and had ups and downs in my career. And then I looked to my son, and you know I'll say it because who cares? Because he and he's a a lovely guy. Um, he played Walter White's son on Breaking Bad. Oh yeah, Bad. yeah, Aaron. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, um, um. Oh, what's his name? I gotta Google it. Can Google, we Google it. it. Let's Google it. I know this is where this is where I gotta have a team. <laughs> we got a team. We got a small team in here. And he couldn't. I mean, the, he's just a lovely guy. He's sitting there. I'm sitting there. And then another buddy of mine, James, who was on One Tree Hill for like 13 seasons. See. We're all there, and mm-hmm. we're all auditioning for the same role. And it R. didn't J. matter. Mitty. R.J. R.J. Well sweet done, guy, sweet kid. R.J. was on the biggest show, show. ever. And not to say that you know he'll have a hundred more wins right. after this, but at this time, at the in the same room with you, yeah. And they're like, yeah, it was the biggest show ever two years ago. Two years ago, what have you done for me lately? Right. And yeah. Here he is, and my buddy James was on. I'm sure around season twelve of mm-hmm. One Trail, he's like, I don't think I'll be in an audition room anytime. But no, nope. listen, here we are, the three I, of us. Listen, I. I remember when I when my pilot didn't get picked up. I did not talk about taking things in stride. I did not take that in stride. I was very sad. Really? Oh my god! Yeah, because it was my first lead, and I it was hurts. and it was multicam. So it really, it really, I was shanked. I felt like I had gotten somebody hit me with a shield. And it was Diablo Cody. Oh, Diablo and, Cody and, and so, Pam Fryman and just so many great people. So all the auspices. It was supposed to go like it's, if you looked at that list of people involved, Donald Faison. Come, Come on, on, this show is supposed to go. Yes. Uh, Greg Berlanti and Sarah Schechter. It was just all perfect people. So when that didn't go, I just was kind of like, dag. And I remember my friends were like, oh, Yvette, you know, you always work. You're going to always work. I'm like, you know, everybody that always works has a time when they no longer work. Like everybody who was that guy or that girl, right. one day they're not that guy or that girl. I don't right. care who you are. Tom Cruise, John Travolta, whoever you are. There's going to come a time in your career where it ebbs. Yes. Now, sometimes it ebbs to nothing, and sometimes it ebbs and then starts to flow again, but there's always downtime. So I'm not one of those people like, well, you know, I've been on, I've done this. I don't, I'm not that chick. Like, as soon as a job ends, I'm like, well, I'll never work again. Yeah. I immediately am sure that I'll never work again. Oh, 100%. Yeah. And I, I don't know, I would assume, I think there's maybe the 1% of the 1% in this business mm-hmm. who don't worry about that anymore, but everyone else. Who are they, though? Like, are they the Jerry Seinfelds who have decided that I, I'm going to end my show when I want to end my show and I'll just do comedy specials and, like, is that is that the person that never has to worry about it or? Well, I think money helps. Yeah. <laughs> And I think money buys you a certain level of security where you're just right. like, for better or for worse. <clears throat> then, you know, you look at someone like Chappelle who yeah. went away. <clears throat> and came back. And But it almost made him, what did, some a uh, great writer said something to the effect of like, Chappelle successfully made himself n- notorious, like mm. a, an ominous figure by leaving. Because right. nobody walks away. No one walks away. From that kind of money, who does that? And even to walk away from that money and then all of us would be like, well, you're done. Right. Like the business is mad at you and right. like, good luck. You, you, you've squandered all of your, your heat. Right. And of course he comes back 10 years later. He's like, no, actually I'm just as good as ever. Yeah. But that kind of tells me, don't you think the talent wins out of for some, for it some, has to, for some, it has to. Otherwise, what are, what are we doing here? Right. Cause like, you know, it's so funny now, especially I was thinking about it too, with like there being this great diversity initiative in the business yes. and, and it being something that's so necessary. Mm-hmm. And like, I remember before this, I would audition for classic leading man roles in TV or film and they'd be like, well, he's a little ethnic. Yeah. You? Oh yeah. Get out of here. It's a little dark. Yeah. Okay. Little, 
you know, swarthy, <laughs> Jewish. It's a little Jewy. He's a little Jewy. He's a little Jewy. Oh my God, Josh. And now it's like, you know, he's just, he's not ethnic enough. He's not ethnic you know? enough. That's true. I get it. I yeah. get it. So there's like, as you said, it's it's dealing with those things of like, well, then I, I've got to hope that what I do works. And right. It, for the right thing in the right circumstance, it will win out. Right. Because there's so many things out of my control. There's, I think, almost feel like everything in this industry is kind of without our outside of our control. We can control our professionalism, mm. how prepared we are for the job, and we can we can control the type of person we are on a set. Yes. Right. Which which I think, if you all are listening, even more than talent, don't be a jerk. Yeah. Don't. There, there's very few jerks that get to have long careers. You have to be. The most talent. You have to be Meryl Streep level talent to get away with jerky behavior. And she's a lovely woman. I'm not saying she's a jerk, but right. I'm saying you have to have talent at that level to be able to have people continually deal with your mess year after year after year. If you if you just got here and you just cute, don't do it. Oh, oh please, hell do no. not do it. Oh my God, life is too short. It's so short. Especially for me, I'm like I know there's five better looking Australian guys waiting for any. Do you any understand role how many? Are you kidding? Lord, I can't even list how many better looking sh- black chicks there are for every role I want. Now speaking of working with jerks, what was working with Chevy Chase? <laughs> sorry, what? what? I'm Excuse sorry. Me. You know, my what? first movie was with him. What movie? Snow Day. How in was 2000. that, Josh? You tell me. How was it? But, we were in a movie together. I don't know if we ever met. <laughs> that okay, but he's a piece of work, and that's like it's known. I yeah, this is the thing. I have never personally or publicly, I personally, I've never publicly talked about Chevy. <laughs> like I don't want to tell a lie. I've never publicly talked about um, Chevy Chase, and you don't have to. And, here. I, and I'm not. <laughs> the reason I don't is because I don't have to. Right. Like I really don't have to, and I feel like in a in a great in a great way. Whatever shenanigans someone does, that's mm. their stuff. Like, you got to own that. And I feel like as soon as I speak up about something that was done to me by some jerk like person, right. it now becomes a part of my narrative. Yes. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not riding with you on my back for the rest of my career. So you do your crappy stuff over there. Right. And let others speak of the mess that you've done. And I'm going to stay, stay on the, sign, the sunny side of the street and keep things positive and, and joyful. So I don't have anything to say. I wish him well. Hope he's happy. I'm sure he is. I'm sure he's got a lot of money. I'm sure he's very happy. I'm sure he's listening. I think he's a big fan of the Curious <laughs> Pod with Josh Peck. Um, <laughs> now, conversely, in like working with um, with <clears throat> Donald Glover for, uh, I mean, were you watching that so much and thinking like, oh yeah, like it's yeah, only a matter I, of listen, time. Listen, and, and it's it's funny. I feel like a broken record because I have talked about this yes. a lot. And, and, and honestly, guys, go back and check. I'm not a Johnny come lately. I've said this about Donald since probably 2009. Donald Glover is the most talented person in every creative endeavor that I have ever met. Mm. Now, I never met Prince, never met Michael Jackson, so don't nobody come for me. <laughs> but I'm saying of the people that I've met, I have not found a creative thing, like a creative lane that Donald Glover can't master. And I think in the years since I first said that, every me saying that has been proven. He's he's a writer, he's a director, he's a singer, he's a rapper, he's a he's an actor, he's he can draw, he can bake. There was oh, one year He can bake. He can bake one year. I draw commu- the line at listen, baking. Listen, one year on community at uh, holiday time, he brought in little tiny uh, sweet potato pies for all of us that he had made tartlets? that morning. Little tartlets, little tartlets. So oh, God, I can't take himself. it. I'm telling you, this I dude, quit. He is. Ever, he's. He literally is that guy. So I totally. There's. No, I, I almost when he says that he's going to stop doing something, I'm almost like good because yeah. that means something great. It's like if he stops doing music, you want him to stop doing music because he's going to start doing Broadway musicals. Right. If he stops doing movies, you want him to stop because he's going to start sculpting. Like it's it's a thousand different things that he could do. And the longer he stays on one, that's one other pursuit that we're missing out on. So let the man live and breathe and let him do what he wants to do. But he's an artist. He's an artist in the purest form and also has never changed. That's the thing that makes me very happy about knowing him and and proud to say that he's my friend. Every time I see him, he's exactly the same person. He's never as successful as he is. It's never gone to his head, which I think, you know, we've met people. We know people who have lost their minds, and he's not one of them. So I have a few friends like that who are are absurdly talented, like where it's not fair, but I'm like, you can't rein it in. Yeah. Like there's something, which it's funny, I was going to ask you about him because I think, at least in my experience, I've seen mm. where 
someone who's effortlessly talented and, you know, so uh, prolific in yeah. so many areas, the one thing that they have in addition to all that yeah. is a winner's attitude. Mm. Like there's a part of their personality that I don't know whether it's that they have blinders on, mm -hmm. whether they're they're insanely more ambitious than we even recognize. Mm -hmm. But like, did you see that as well in him? Yeah, because I don't know that it's, it might be the blinders. There's a line in in um in Hamilton where they say, why do you write like you're running out of time? Mm. That's what I think of when I think of Donald. Donald creates like he's running out of time. Yes. He creates as if he's the only person on the planet that does know exactly how long he's going to live. Like he got a, he got a message at 10 saying you got 75 years. And he's like, well, I got to get it in. Like that's what it, that's how he creates. So it's 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 almost like it just has to get out. Yeah. It just has to get out and it's got to come out in every possible way that it can come out and that's what he's doing. He's he's honoring the gifts. I think it was Denzel Washington that said the the richest place in the world is a is a graveyard. Right. Cuz it's full of all these different ideas and plans and dreams that people didn't fulfill and Donald's not one of those guys. He's not going to leave here with stuff unfulfilled. Right. Which is great and his his brother Stephen is just as talented. I feel like his I don't know what was in the water at his parents' house, but it was just delicious and talent filled. It was it's something good. Right. The water at my house was like no, childhood no, obesity. No. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. No, Comedic no, no. brilliance. Never. I want to say this too, since we're talking about community. I, I don't want to lay too much on Donald and not say how lovely everyone else was too. Like, oh, it's talented. And they're all killing amazing. it. Amazing. Everybody's still working and we see each other in different configurations out in the world and. You know, I do my best to promote everything that they're all doing because they're just all so super talented and yeah. good people. What? So then you're growing up and you're in the land in <laughs> Cleveland. When? What was your first foray in acting? Ooh, well, you know, acting wasn't really my thing. Music was my thing, mm. and uh, I I didn't really act in anything really until I was, I think, in in high school. I think it was like in tenth grade. Just on a whim. Yeah, I think I just joined the, I think the drama ministry, the drama ministry, it's my church drama club. <laughs> the drama club was doing fame and it was like a co-partnership with the choir. And so our choir, every time there was a song, somebody from the choir would sing the songs. Right. So I think that's how I got kind of into it that way. And then was like, well, this is fun, you know, but just, it's not that I was against acting. I just always loved music more. Right. I still do. I love music. I yeah. And I hear that too. I, I, it's funny with people that do that do both. Yeah. I usually hear there's unless it's like an actor, you know, it's some Eddie Murphy shit. Yeah. Like I guess I'll make an album. Right. I'm famous <laughs> I enough. Might as well. <laughs> yeah. Right. But usually musicians turned act actors. They always say, and I don't know whether I think it's the self creation of music. Right. And that you're in control of it, whereas yeah. an actor, you're so out of control of right. most things. But I think also that's why. Music broke my heart in a way that acting never can. Mm. Because when you put out, um, uh, back in the day we used to do demo tapes. Now everybody, you can put your own stuff up on iTunes and you don't need a record label. An but EP. Yeah, you do uh. EP. When I was coming up, you had to have a record a record label behind you or you couldn't put an album out. Sure. So the the bread and our bread and butter trying to get a deal was you were always doing demo tapes. You were always in the studio, always doing demo tapes, trying to get it in the hands of somebody or trying to sing live. When I got my record deal, I had sung live for Michael Bivens from BBD. That's how I got my record deal. What was Who was it with? <clears throat> it deal? was with Motown. Okay. Yeah, Motown, Biv 10. Uh, Michael Bivens, around the time he discovered Boys to Men, had a group called the East Coast Family, and I was one of the acts in that group. Okay. But I met him in Cleveland. I, he was in town performing with BBD, and I just followed him around a hotel lobby, begged to sing for him, and got signed that way. But um, I remember with the demo tape thing, you, your whole soul is in that tape. Right. And you're handing it to someone, and if they play it in front of you, you're watching their face to see, like, do they like it? And it's not even do Ugh. they like it, it's do they like me, right? Oh, yeah. Whereas with acting, I ain't me. I'm Helen Dubois. Right. I'm you're... Shirley Bennett. Like, it's not me. So if you don't like it, you don't like what Dan Schneider or Dan Harmon wrote. Right. That has nothing to do with me. I didn't pick my clothes. I didn't pick my hair. I didn't, I, I'm saying lines I didn't say. It's not me. So you can kind of walk away, kind of wipe your hands and be like, well, sorry, that was a turd, but it was not my fault. Yeah. Whereas if you release an album. It's all on your And shoulders. it doesn't do well, or you release a single and, and people hate it, that's you. That's all you. Especially if you, if you wrote it, if you're a single songwriter. It's all you. And so at what point did you say, did you have anyone 
support you? Like, was anyone in your life saying, like, yeah, like, you got something here with this acting thing? Like, you, you should know, do acting, this. Actually, ironically, uh, when I was with uh, Motown, Michael's aunt, um, Diane Bivens, was like kind of our pseudo road manager, manager. Mm. She was kind of there. And they were doing this show, this movie. It aired on Fox. It was called Divas. And it was like about four singers. And you had to be able to sing and you had to act. And I remember Diane said, you should audition for this. I was still in Cleveland. I was like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to do any of that. She said, well, just get a video camera and have somebody videotape you. Send the tape to me and I'll send it on. And so I got the size. I kind of know what I was doing. I don't know how I looked on that tape. And I sent it to her and she called me and she said, you know, I'm going to send this to the Fox people. She said, but I really think you might want to consider acting. Like wow. nothing against your singing, you're a great singer, but you really have something as an actor. And I never, I never thought of it like that. Like I was going to be a singer. Yes. You know, I would be a singer that would do a little guest star or something on a sitcom or something they needed to. A Rihanna. A route, I'd be a Rihanna. Per, perhaps. You know yeah. what I mean? Maybe a little Lauren Hill. A movie here or there. A movie Sister here. Sister Act 2, perhaps. A little, little Whitney, a little bodyguard every now and again. <laughs> sure. But I wasn't going to pursue that. So that yeah, she was the first person, I think, that really was like, you might be able to do this. It's mm. really weird. And I ended up doing it. And touring around with boys to men and whatnot, I yeah. mean, for a, a wonderful religious woman as yourself, yes. I imagine there I must have I, been some experiences. I have a story. Oh, yes. I do. Please. This is a good story. And, and also know this, like back then, I don't know I don't know how they are now, but back then boys to men were just as, you know, religious and prudish as I was. We were like Christian kids out on the road with BBD. Don't okay. trust a big button to smile. Right. And it was one night, we were in New York, we had just done, um, well, Boys to Men had just done a Showtime at the Apollo. We were all staying in this great hotel, like on Times Square, it was like living the life. And I remember I was calling everybody in the East Coast fam, I couldn't find anybody. And then someone finally answered and said, oh, everybody's at a party in Mike's room on whatever floor it was. Mm. So I went up to the floor, and I looked down the hallway, sure enough, it's like people knocking on this one door, and the door opens, and they go in. I'm like, well, that's where the party is. <laughs> right. I ain't never been a party person in my life. But it's Michael Bivens and it's the East Coast family. Yeah, you're party. living. I'm living my life. And my idea of what a, par a party is, is probably, especially back then, I had no idea what how they party in Hollywood. I had no idea. So I go up to the door and I knock and the door opens like a crack. Mm. And I go to just, you know, and I said, um, I said, I'm, I'm coming in. They said, no. I can't remember who was at the door. I can't remember if it was Michael or just someone else. And they said no. And I said, well, and I just saw so-and-so and so-and-so go in here. They were like, this party's not for you, Yvette. You don't want any part You don't this. want any part. And I'm like, but it's, and the people, this will kill me, Josh, the two people I saw go in were younger than me. So I thought it was like, oh, maybe they're drinking and I'm not old enough. I'm like, sure. but so-and-so came in. It was like, I don't care who you're seeing come in here. This party is not wow. for you. And so I left going back to my room and I felt like, Dang, nobody want to be with me. I'm not the cool kid yeah, or whatever. Yeah, left out. I found out years later from Boys to Men that they weren't allowed in either. Really? <laughs> right. And so apparently, and I don't know, to this day I don't know what was happening in that room, but apparently what it was happening what was happening was something that whoever answered that door was like, this isn't for you. And I'm grateful to this day for all the people that have been a gatekeeper for me when I didn't have the sense to be a gatekeeper for myself. Right. I I'm glad that there's something on me that they're like, mm-mm. This isn't for no, you. No, girl, this ain't for you. Like, I still get that. Sometimes people are like, you don't want, don't come to this party. You don't need to come. I've been to those parties. What happens at those parties, Josh? It, we're not playing board games and <laughs> drinking apple cider. <laughs> yeah, I've never, honestly, in my entire adult life, I've never been to a party where anything has happened or I've seen anything that I would not be okay with, which tells the, me. The cocaine? The, the, the cocaine. I've never seen, listen, I've never seen drugs in real life. I've never been around it. I've never even seen anybody do drugs. Like I just, unless uh, on television. So that, yeah. So if that's what's happening, that ain't the party for me. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know if it's a party for anyone. Yeah. Well, some, oh, not some. for me. Or some. Not, not for me, yeah, for sure. But yeah. yeah, I mean, the depravity, the, when you walk into those things and you just see kind of, and for me, right at 18, years old when I started yeah. seeing these things go on and just growing up in the yeah. business in LA. Yeah, I can't even imagine. I mean, I think for certain people that are healthy, <laughs> well, I think there's, prudish. I mean, certain people walk into those things and go, oh, I want no part of this. Right. And I just remember walking in and, and thinking, oh, I've seen movies like this. Yeah. So it, did it feel familiar or did it feel like? It felt odd. It felt foreign. Did it, were you scared at all? Did anything about it go, ooh, 
Ooh. The first time I, I did any sort of uh, anything that would hurt my mom's feelings it yeah. was over a girl. So it's very Aww. Shakespearean. I just wanted to impress Wanted and be, be a cool. part of. And so I didn't think twice. And then I also had sort of the uh, the impunity of being young yeah. and fearless. And it was before social media, too, praise God. Before social media, thank God. So, And I always say that, too, because people will be nice enough to say to me, like, wow, like you were a kid actor and you didn't completely lose your mind. You're and like, I'm like, don't ask Yvette for a quote. Because <laughs> well, like, she was on set and saw it. But thankfully... It was... i got to say this, though. I... It... It was shocking to me mm. just because when your mother wasn't around you were my baby like right. you were you guys me I love me some Josh Peck and that that was so funny like on the show I, I was like hated jo Helen hated Josh but Yvette loves Josh and so I was just it was my little pumpkin pumpkin uh -huh. and I'm the last person to notice that somebody has gone to the dark side like I just don't right. even it doesn't register because you were my little pumpkin so I don't even remember the first time you said something to me that hurt my feelings or something where I was just like, well, where'd my baby go? Where's my oh, baby? No. Where's my baby? Oh, it's all flooding yeah. back to me now. <laughs> oh, Jesus. You know, but this is the thing. These are the growing pains. This is what happens in this business. The 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 beautiful thing is that you came out of it yes. and you are the man that you are now. And ha maybe had you not experienced some of that stuff, you wouldn't be the man you are now. You right. might have fallen into something even worse later on. You know what I mean? I think so for sure. And, you know, if you look at my, and God knows I've unpacked this in therapy mm -hmm. over time, but look, I've, I've always had an affinity for overindulging in things. And Hi, so, right, right. Right. And at a young age, it was what was easily available, which was food, food. and sugar. And, right. and then I lost all this weight and I got in shape, but I had the same mind. Right. And I didn't have any sort of spirituality or mm -hmm. 12 step or what have you to, to counteract it. Right. So, all of a sudden, smoking and drinking and, yeah. and living that life seemed appealing. And I also romanticized people like Hunter S. Thompson yeah. and Basquiat and yeah. Hendrix and all these like bad boys. Right. And the reality was like I was a kid from Burbank. Right. Like uh, I'm right. Josh from Drake and Josh. Right. I'm not tough. What? Right. And so I lived that out for three years. And then thankfully at a young age, at 21, I, I woke up to the fact that it just wasn't working for me right. any longer. and. And I've been sober since then. Okay. And so, and as a direct result, it's attracted all these wonderful things into my mm -hmm. life. And like, I think about, you know, I met my wife at 24, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is really wild. Um, but I think that, you know, she's a good girl with yeah. a normal family system and healthy yeah. boundaries. And right. and I'm sure that there's nothing about me that would have attracted her had I still had been. Had you stayed in that life? Right. Right. That's what's so good. I mean, I made a movie with that kid Orlando from, from That's So Raven. Oh, bless his heart. And, oh, like, God. I see him out there and, and other people like that where I'm like, oh, man, like, come yeah, here. Yeah. Like, we let's work on this. Let's it doesn't have it. to be this way. I know, but I think this industry, I don't know, I don't know what it is. Like, I, I used to think that it was because child actors are people pleasers, right? Because uh -huh. you, you, you want to get the role and you want to keep the role. And, sure. And so maybe the first time someone offers you something that you know you shouldn't say yes to, you just go, okay, well, everybody's doing it. And I just think that they get lost in the shuffle because there's nobody there to show them that there's another way. Yes. You know what I mean? Um, I want to say something else, too, because it may have been implied that I like Josh and I don't like Drake in real life. And I like them both in real life. And I want to make sure I make that clear. But it's not balanced, guys. Let me make the, that clear. Yeah, I don't want the she has an affinity for me. <laughs> Sorry, Drake. Because no. <laughs> I can see the Twitters now. Oh, my God. Yvette said that she doesn't like Drake. That is not what I said. I love Drake, too. But, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, in, like I'm interested to know what your experience was walking on the set with Drake and Josh. And Ah, what was it like? Um, you know, it was weird for me because it's one of the first things I ever did. Yes. I grew up watching Nickelodeon, the early Nickelodeon, like uh, you can't do that on television and all of that. And Classic. Being on Nickelodeon was actually one of my childhood dreams when I was a kid too. Like I wanted to be on Nickelodeon and so I was actually about to be on Nickelodeon. It was weird when I came on the set and it was very clear that the kids were the stars. So mm. I'm used to, up to that point, I was used to adults being the stars and the kids being, you know, but on that show, we even on the set, like there was like ice cream and cookies and you know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like it looked like we walked into I walked into a cartoon, you know? Right. So that part was uh eye opening. And then I'm but the other thing that made it okay is I'm such a PG thirteen kind of person, like 
I'm supposed to be on Nickelodeon and, and Disney. Like, it's just like the mothership calling me home. And you guys were so good. All of you were so talented and everybody was so welcoming. And it's one of the best experiences of my acting career. And it is what and which with community in regards to to getting recognized. Um, tell me which. about that. Yeah. I mean, are you, because it's a mind you know, it's a mind fuck for me. Yeah. Watch, seeing how this show has, because, and you can yeah. speak to this. When we made it, yeah. no one cared. No one cared. No one cared. Mm -mm. It was before social media. Yep. So it didn't have that cachet of like Lizzie McGuire or right. Hannah Montana. Right. And now that it has lived in memes and quotes, you know, over a decade later, it, bugs me out. Can yeah. you believe it? No, I can't. And I and the thing that bugged me out about it and still does, like you talked about it a little bit earlier where you'll have a fan that comes up that's 10 and a fan that comes up that's 20 that's 29. That blows my mind. Every 4 or 5 years a brand new group of babies discovers this show. Right. So that means for the rest of our lives, Josh, we'll be in Ralph's <laughs> it's with crazy. a little baby tugging. Were you Drake? Were, were you Drake and Josh? Like that is literally <laughs> well, I hear it once a day. Really? Once, at least once a day. And that's what I was saying. For the longest time, Drake and Josh was the one I got recognized for the most. Now it's community and Drake and Josh are sure. equal. But the fact that we finished Drake and Josh 12 years ago, and I'm still getting stopped every day by a kid or a 29-year-old, dude, you made my childhood, dude. It's you know unreal. What I mean? and it's unreal. Do people ask you where we are? Always. Always? Okay, oh my good. God. Do they ask you where I am? They don't ask you where I am. They ask, Well, they always say, where's your brother? Where's oh Drake? God. And I always like... It's not in my pocket. I, read, <laughs> I, I see red for a second. Right. And I want to be like, where the fuck do, do you think he is? is? <laughs> like, it's not, I don't... They don't say where you are, but they say, do you still talk to Drake and Josh? Right. Do you still see Drake and Josh? Amazing. Are you still friends with Drake and Josh? <laughs> Amazing. Like, if we would have stayed on Instagram... Well, they wouldn't done it, have done it because you were with me, but... Anytime I go live, I don't care where I am, what I'm, there is going to be at least one person that goes, do you still talk to Drake and Josh? Or are you guys going to do another reunion movie? Yeah. I hear it all the time, which means that's good. That's In my eyes, Josh, that's making it yes. because we are part of people's DNA. They grew up watching us. They came home from school and they watched us. They remember things that we said. They remember things that we wear. Somebody was like said something about nostropecia the other day online. Like, <laughs> I met someone with nostropecia and I immediately thought of Helen and I was like, wow. That's a deep like, cut. That's a deep cut, man. Yeah. That's an album. That's an album hit. That's, that's a B-side. That, yeah, that's B-side, deep, deep track. B-side, deep track. I yeah. mean, it's cr <clears throat> and you're so right. And I, and when I say I see red, I overcome that quickly and then respond with probably at his house you're or right. making music on yeah. tour or whatever. You're right. And every year that goes by that I have more separation from it and yeah. see the way the show has affected people, I have more appreciation yeah. for it. Because, you know, how rare is it that you've done something that's affected people? People that, that and this is a thing, generations of people too. Like you can do something that's a moment in time, but we've been given this great gift that for the rest of our lives, some child will know us yes. for the rest of our lives. And they're all growing up. So right now, the, 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 they're 29-year-olds. One day, they'll be 40-year-olds. Right. One day, they'll be 50-year-olds if we live long enough. And they will remember when I was a kid. Because I remember uh, the Jeffersons and Different Strokes and all those Cosby show. Like, I remember all of those people from those shows. If I were to see them on the street, I'd be like, oh, my God. When I was 12, I used to watch your show. Mm. It never leaves. So it's a, such a gift. It's such a gift, and and especially doing the show with Stamos, who has his own version Ooh, of that come and on, with more. Full House, please, please, and please. he's and he would he would educate me and be like, ride that, yeah. enjoy it, bro. <coughs> right, like these people are going to be good to you for the rest. Be good to them, and they will be good 100%, to you. Hundred percent, because one day you're going to be doing conventions. <laughs> right, we're going to be sitting right next to each other with our canes, please. signing Drake and Josh pictures. I'll be right there talking about how do you spell your name? <laughs> yeah, I sure will. And Lou Ferrigno on the other side. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny too. I remember you on set, and I wonder if you had this feeling. And I imagine you must have been aware of it to a certain extent. There were only two people that ever came on set as guest stars, where it was immediately clicked in for everyone of like, oh yeah, really, like, this who, person's a star. Who was the other one? You and Jerry Trainer. Oh Crazy wow, Steve. Crazy Steve. Yes. Because it's and I've been and God knows you've been done so many guest spots yeah. and and I've done my own share. And you walk into a TV show that's already been up and going yep. a few seasons, and you're kind of like. 
oh God, let me just say my lines and right. get out of here, and right? Get out of right. here. I don't even like. I don't even need to meet the stars, right? Like whatever, right. because you know you don't want to get into their orbits. Right. They've got their own rhythm. So for you to come and show up and not only be that way with your personality mm. where it just was a joy, but then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm going to leave an impression. Aww. Like I'm going to make myself known here. And then, God, it's got to be gr- – I mean, that's a dream as a guest star to be yeah. like immediately for the writers to be like, oh, we need – like, Let's bring her back. Is she around next week? Like, that's let's, so, you know let's what's so funny? Going. Because it was the first – one of the first things I ever did, I didn't know that that was rare. Right. You know what I mean? So I, I just thought that – I just thought that the first episode was your tryout. Sure. You know what I mean? So I'm, sure. for the longest time, I thought, oh, they want to see if they, because he works at the movie theater, so nine times out of ten, they just want to see if they like this woman. Yeah. And it was never if they like me. They just need me to say these lines to see if they want her to stay. So right. weird. You know, it, it it's funny, too. I I, I did a guest spot on the short-lived show uh, Pitch on ah, Fox. Ah, Pitch. And I did one episode, then they brought me back for a second one. Yeah. And in the it was the the season finale, and they fired me because I was working for the baseball yeah. organization. It's like this big moment, and I get fired. Yeah. And I remember, and I felt like I think I'm you know working. Might be back. Yeah. I might be back here. And then I remember the director Paris Barclay, yeah. oh, who's like him. a Jedi, yeah. like a master director, and and one of the loveliest people. And he he came up to me after rehearsal, and he's like, "You're not really fired." <laughs> we're gonna bring you back like, next season right cause but I imagine like think look after 20 years I was like ah if this is the last episode like it was a fun run right but I'm you know a person who if that was their first job and they get fired on the show right like, you would well, think that like, do a good job yeah you'd be like wow they wrote in my right. exit so that it right. made sense for the show right but you know what's so deep too this is going back to when I was saying the best thing you can do as a performer is be professional and also be kind and be a good person on set a lot of times, I think, your job continues because they like you have, having you around. For it's sure. like, you know, if it's not a closed-ended role as written, if you're at the local drugstore down the street, you always need to think, if I am a decent human being and I hit these jokes, they might have to come and get some old Pringles in the next episode, and I might be the guy or the girl that sells them. I think that you have to always think about that. It's It's... Your personality and the the feeling you give people is almost more important than what you do when they say action. Yes. You know what I mean? Because oh. we've all been around really talented people that are jerks, and it's just a horrible feeling. I go to set and deal with this jackass. You know what I mean? It's just, ugh. You know ugh. how we all, in real life, whether you're in entertainment or not, want a guy? Yeah. You know how we all like, you know when you get a handyman when you own a home and you find a guy who fixes something yeah. well at a good price, you're like, oh, I got, I got my, my guy. guy. I got my guy. Put him in on speed dial. Right. I've got my guy. I got my guy. That's what a showrunner wants. Right. They want to know that the actor, the writer, right. like I can, ha- he is someone that's going to show up, he or yep. she, and they are going to perform every time, whether it's today or 10 years from right. now. Right, right. And then they don't have to think about it. Yeah. They don't have to cast again. That's right. They don't have to put out another, that's right. you know, job application or it's whatever. It's a delicate dance too, like you're saying, coming to set. Uh, there's a lot of big egos on sets. Huge. Huge. And there's some people, you will hear the saying, a generous actor, people that are listening, a generous actor is someone that actually shares, and they're okay if you get the punchline. It doesn't have to be all about them. Yes. There's a lot of people that who are big stars may not be generous like that. And so if you come on set, I just heard a story yesterday from a friend <laughs> who's working on something and somebody is not generous. Oh, I believe And, um, you know, they their lines are getting cut, and they're being uh, written out of scenes because the sparkle that they naturally bring is just too much for the star. Yeah, they're start. threatened. Yeah, anytime you have to ask someone to dim their light for you to shine, you need to question your light source. Right. If your light source is pure, there's nobody that can, can you don't need someone else to dim in order to shine. You're just going to shine. That's mm. just the way it is. So if you find yourself trying to sabotage someone else's rise, you are out of line, completely out of line. What do you do in those situations where... <clears throat> if somebody's threatened... If, if you can tell that someone who perhaps might have more power than you mm-hmm. and is feeling threatened and, and sabotaging you, whether they know it or not. I have this great, I have really good discernment. And when I walk on a set, I can immediately tell the vibe. First of all, I never overplay. Mm. I always play my position, only my position. If I'm a guest star or uh, number five on the call sheet, I'm never going for the big joke. I'm a, I'm a service the role. Sure. And I'm going to rock my corner of the screen, 
right? Yes. But I'm never going to rock it to a point where anybody, any attention is being pulled because I understand the people's name above that show title are the ones people are coming to see. They may enjoy the, the comedy stylings of Yvette Nicole Brown in the corner, <laughs> but they've come in to see the two or three names at the top. You're a utility I'm player. I'm a utility player, and I know that um, about myself. I also make sure I let the star know on the first day, anything you need from me, I'm here for you. I'm here to service you, whatever you need. And I make sure they hear that from me. So, you know, if 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 I'm in a position you don't need me to be in, if I'm in your way when you're trying to get to somewhere for your punchline, move me out the way, do what you got to do, I'm here for you. So from day one, they're very clear that I'm not coming to take nothing, I'm not trying to steal nothing, I'm here to service the, the work. Yeah. And usually when you let them know, it, it, the the aware ones can go, okay, this one's safe, I don't have to stress. Because I do a lot of guest co-hosting on talk shows too. Mm. And <clears throat> I try to make sure they know, I'm here to make your show great. I'm not here to make myself great. You're in service right. to the I'm project. Right, I'm in service to the project. I'm, I'm warming a seat for a day. Mm. I'm not trying to take this person's job. I'm not trying to outshine anything this person has done. I'm trying to service the topics we're talking about and make sure I provide you a nice setup for your punchlines. I literally am here to support you. And I think that's the reason I'm invited back because nobody's looking at me like, she tried to take my job. I'm not. I don't right. want nobody's job. I want, I want my own stuff. I ain't yeah. trying to get nobody's stuff. You know, so it's it's just knowing how to, to read the room, you know, um, I know that I find that so to be true because every time I've let my ego walk in first yeah, you can't. and like, look what, let me show y'all what I can do. Yeah, never. Like, I got this bag of tricks. It's always when I walk, walk away devastated yeah, because yeah. I've set up this expectation for myself instead of, and that's in every level of artistry too. Right. Like there's something bigger at play here. Right. And we are just, but a, a player in it. Right. And, and I also don't think Josh, that they want our tricks till they want our tricks. Like, yeah. Let me explain that. Yeah. If if they want our tricks when it's the Josh Peck show, mm. right? When it's the Yvette Nicole Brown show, they want every to bring up the toy chest, the treasure chest, dump it all out on the table, and let's create something from everything you have. When you're guest starring, it ain't your day. Yeah. It ain't your gig. Now, if you are with someone who's generous, one of the most generous comedic actresses of, actors I've ever worked with is Cedric the Entertainer. If you are ever blessed to work with Cedric the Entertainer, Take it up. Cedric is so generous that I did four four episodes over four seasons on Soul Man, his show with Nisi Nash. And me and Cedric Yarbrough were fools. And we were written as fools. Our characters were these really weird neighbors. And we always had some nonsense going on. And you and Cedric comedy Come pros. On. We, yes. I mean, they knew what they were hiring. True. And, right. and to, to Nisi and Cedric's credit... They wanted us for the roles. Nisi called me. Remember, I was getting my hair colored, and she called me. I'm under that dryer. Girl, there's a role they didn't wrote for you, and you need to come on and do it. And I was <laughs> like, okay. So she she's not threatened by people. Cedric's not threatened by people. Cedric was number one on the call sheet. He's the guy people are tuning in to see. Yeah. There were scenes where Cedric was getting a ridiculous laugh, like just he's a fool. He's doing something that's ridiculous. And anybody else would have went and whispered into the director's ear, and the next day, whatever that bit was, would have been cut. Cedric laughed and told Cedric, do more of that. Actually, you guys, can y'all cut my line that comes after that? Because I want him to be able to fully do the blah, blah, blah. So there were times when Cedric took, jo took jokes away from himself so that me and Cedric could have a full run of it. That's, that's why, generous. That's why his name is the entertainer, the entertainer, and not the selfish no. jerk. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's and there's been many more, but he's the, he's the one that sticks out in my mind. Is just ridiculously generous, and Hugh Laurie too on House is very generous. Uh, yeah, and I think that uh, to your point is such. I mean, we all win mm -hmm. when it's working. It's like yeah. we all win, and I've been on those sets, and and I think you're right in the sense of like as a guest star, you don't know if someone who's the lead of the show. This is the scene that you're in is right. one of seven. They have right. to shoot that day. Right. And like, and it's not all about it's you. It's not. You're servicing. My, most of the guest stars I was, I did was like, oh, here's your coffee. It right. can't be about the girl saying, here's your coffee. <laughs> now, it's funny you say that because <laughs> yeah. I took some photos of parts you played. Oh, God. And I, as an actor, <laughs> think this is so inspiring, right? Because, and I know that earlier we touched on the fact that you're worried that, that you could be entering some sort of ebb, which is just your kid. own, right. you know, fear-based stuff that we right. all have. And. I think this is why you are who you are and you work so much okay. and why you're so respected because I'm so scared. you've played roles such as clerk number one. Clerk number one. 
art student. Art student. That was on uh, uh, <laughs> iCarly. Old Navy saleswoman. That was Eddie Murphy film. Receptionist. Thousands of times. I can't even name the project. Pex assistant. Pex assistant. That was Tropic Thunder. Matthew Perry. I mean, Matthew McConaughey was Peck. Curtis secretary. That Curtis's was, secretary. That was in Dream Girls. That role was cut. Female security agent number two. That was probably what, Malcolm in the Middle? Uh, TSA agent? Yes. <laughs> yes, Malcolm in the Middle. Uh, woman in restaurant. Oh, I don't even know. I've done that a thousand times. <laughs> Production <laughs> assistant. Uh, was that uh, uh, the the Kate Catherine Heigl movie? Uh, br- br- little Black Book. <laughs> oh, little, I've, I've been production assistant a couple of times. Okay, that was Little Black Book. Classic. Stewardess. Yeah, that was Curb Your Enthusiasm. Server. That was For the People. Woman. A thousand times. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, other woman. Other woman. Most of my roles have no names, you guys. I mean, that's... But to <laughs> me, and every time where... Maybe before, or even like when you were doing stuff like community yeah. and like these big marquee roles. Yeah. Whenever I would see you in a big movie having like a smaller part like yeah. that, A, you always made it special. Aww. And B, I had so much respect because I feel like that's how you keep working. That's what it is. It's, and I, you know who else does this too? Like I don't say no to anything. And I got this from Samuel L. Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson doesn't say no to anything if they pay his rate. Right. And and mine that's is- a, It's a good rate though. <laughs> it's a good rate. <laughs> My caveat to that is if they pay my rate and it's also something that I, you know, I'm, I'm PG-13, so it has to be something that I can actually do. But for the most part, I don't say no to things. That's why I'm on game shows. I'm on talk shows. I'm on commercials. I do cartoons. Like, I just, I enjoy making people laugh and I enjoy, you know, playing. And it's like play to me, so I don't say no. And I don't think any of that is beneath me. If someone were to call me today and go, it's a great movie and your role is woman number five, I will be woman number five. And they'll add that to the list. Right. You know? I uh, quickly to I uh, forgot to mention that yeah. I was once on a plane with Cedric the Entertainer huh. and as we got off he had a carry-on which was just a case for hats 100% man he's a smooth dude he is a hat That's man a and smooth like dude. there must have been two or three beautiful fedoras oh, in yeah. there and oh, it was yeah. it was a hard case oh, I'm not yeah. talking a soft oh no, he's not he's not checking that he was ready he's to gonna go carry that those are high-end hats They're high-end hats man gotta so, so respect yeah, someone yeah, he's, a, he's a clean dude he's a clean dude um Okay, so one of my last questions is No, we're almost done. As an actress, how yeah. do you approach a part? How do you what's your what's your method? What's your way into a, a character? How I, do you prepare? I am I'll say this and I've said it before. I'm very hacky. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? I'm so hacky. I'm not trained as an actor. Did you take any classes or No, I took well, I took a like a beginning acting experiencing theater is what it was called in mm. college. And then I took a couple of acting classes here as a wonderful woman that taught that I audited, audited a few classes, but that was like maybe three months of my life that I've been in class. And I'm not saying that um, proudly. I'm actually feel like I probably should have studied more. So I don't have like the, the toolbox that other actors have where it's like, I'm going to write a detailed history of mm. who this woman is. Um, I literally just say the lines as if, I was experiencing, like, how would I feel if my husband cheated on me and was now standing over me with a knife? Right. Like, that's a very real thing. I can play that. I know what that feels like. I don't know what it feels like, but I could imagine what that would feel like. So I just come at it from that perspective. And I just try to be real in the moment. But as far as, like, like, what's my motivation in this moment? Yeah. I'm not. And I just did a film. I just did a film with uh, Ben Platt. Up in Vancouver, Ben Platt and, and Lola Kirk. It's going to be a sweet little indie film, and it's one of the first. It's the first indie I've ever done, and it's some heavy, some heavy things. And it's like a the, the theme of it is is heavy. It's got comedy, but it's heavy. And there was a scene where my character has to walk up to Ben and console him, and you know it's a really deep moment. And they, the director Peter Sattler was like, "So how much runway do you need, Yvette? You need us to back up the scene, like." you know, four or five lines. I was like, no, just say action. I'll go up and I'll consult him. And he's like, well, it's a pretty heavy scene event. Like you might, you might want some runway. I'm like, sure. I got it. I got it. And so he said action. I went up and I consoled him. He was like, oh, okay. And then after I did it, I was like, wait a minute. He was concerned. Maybe I should be concerned. Like maybe I'm not giving it the weight that I should, but for some reason it just clicks in my mind and I yeah. just know I just feel it. I know what it I know what it feels like. Mm. So I don't know if maybe I just 
have a natural affinity for feelings and I can get there easily. I don't know what it is, but I don't need a lot of, you know, like if they say that you just ran a marathon and you got to be tired, I don't need to run around the block right. to be tired. I can I can play tired. Yeah, you can you know summon I mean? it. I can summon it. Um, and I don't know that I'll always be able to do it. I don't know that if we'd have done five, 50 takes, I'd have been able to do it. Hmm. But I know that uh, Peter didn't move, never moved on unless he felt he had it and he moved on so that whatever I, I did naturally was enough for him. So I wonder if, too, maybe it's freeing in an interesting way because, like, I've had a lot of training mm-hmm. and yet – and then sometimes I'm bogged down in the have I mined this enough? Have I applied my training enough? Wow. Or – yeah, sometimes there. I guess it's really just second guessing. Like, right. have I done everything I can to fully prepare myself for what this requires? But I feel like you, and, and being a, innately a comedian, mm. you, excuse me, you have it in you to translate that to drama because it's still music. Yes. Don't you feel that? So, I mean, I understand the idea of training because, like I said, even I think I should train because I feel like it's something you should have because this is the other thing. Once I reach the end of my toolbox, I've reached the end of my toolbox. Sure. So, you know, those that have trained can use their natural instincts up to a point, and then if they they need another gear, they got a toolbox they can open up and, and grab another gear. Once I get to the end of my what I can do, that's all I got. Right. So I think that there's – I just think you might naturally have it in you too, and I think you might be overthinking Definitely. some of it. I think there's a big overthinking part of it, I think – I betrayed the comedy for a while because it came so naturally. Easily, yeah. And then I realized what a, a gift it was and how nine out of ten times in life we're finding the levity even in the right. toughest moments. Yeah. Because rarely do we allow ourselves to be completely bogged down That's in true. the shit. That's true. And emotionally wrecked. We're always yeah. making light of things. We're covering, mm-hmm. camouflaging our real feelings. Right. Well, someone said once about crying on film. They said most people in real life, don't want to cry. Right. So when you see something in the script that's like, she cries her river of tears. No, most people are fighting the crying. If they fall apart, it is, they're mad at themselves that they're showing this much emotion, mm. male and female. So it's almost better to play the reality of it instead of even what's written. You know, I just think our bodies are hardwired to know if they make the experience real enough on set, your body is hardwired to do it. And I think to... It might be something that I have in me because I do a lot of voiceovers, a lot of cartoons, and there's nothing. There's no environment. It's like mm. you're a flying jaguar in Avalor, you know, and you see the go-go berry tree. It's like, I don't, ain't no go-go berry tree up in it. Yeah, exactly. And you're not flying, in the, but you got to find a way to Create see it. it and make it come through your voice, you know. God Just bless make, those voiceover gigs, right? Oh, I love those voiceover gigs. Oh, man. They have kept me from having to become a waiter Do at you times. understand? Thank God for the Ice Age I franchise. St- Dude, you and Ice Age. I, I still haven't gotten a movie. I'm dying to get a, a cartoon. Oh, you will. Movie. I'm like, please. I'm like, is there another lane? Because I've, like, maximized the cartoon television lane. I'm like, can I can I shift into yeah, I'm ready. whatever that next gear is, please? Upgrade me. Can I upgrade? Yeah, no, it's, it's great money. Oh, great money. the voiceover... That's just a y'all, beautiful. Y'all don't even know. Yeah, y'all don't even it. know. Okay, that's it. Goodbye. Bye, guys. <laughs> Bye. That was it. That was Yvette Nicole Brown. How lucky were we to just have that conversation going through our 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 our, our ears, our ears. We are lucky. Thank you again, Yvette. You are truly the best, and uh, and I just. I loved it. Guys, have a great week. This is it. I'm sure you're getting that pang in your stomach that I get when podcasts come to an end of like, ah, more. Maybe not. Maybe you've turned it off already. Maybe you're like, no, that was just the right amount. I'm done with this. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to switch now to something else. And if so, God bless you. You know what I mean? I'm going to switch to something else when I end this outro. I'm going to go eat lunch with my mom at our local deli. You know, go to...